In the run-up to the release of both the Xbox series of systems and the PlayStation 5, there was a lot of discussion of the GPU capabilities, hardware-based ray tracing, 3D audio, and all of the other stuff which goes into the next generation systems. But in my personal opinion, the two standout features were both the CPU offering massive leaps and bounds performance over its predecessor, the Jaguar in both the Xbox One and the PlayStation 4, as well as the SSD. And yeah, the SSD, it really can change the way that developers create game experiences. And I've discussed this previously in another video, which I'll link in the video description. But the Xbox Series X and the PlayStation 5 have a major advantage over the PC. Not only is the NVMe drive a standard in both systems, but just as critically, it also has a decompression block. This offloads the decompression of data from the CPU to a dedicated chip in the console's SOC. And this means that the PC is going to have a very interesting time adopting. But with this video, I don't want to bring you problems. I want to tell you the solution to these problems. And well, Microsoft have you covered here. There are going to be two pieces of tech we're going to focus on, both direct storage as well as the sampler feedback system. Now, I do want to warn you guys that if you're a developer, if you're a programmer, this video is probably not for you. It's going to be a quick overview for those who perhaps have missed some of this stuff or perhaps a little less technically inclined. I will though provide a ton of links in the description of this video to a ton of conferences from Microsoft themselves as well as Nvidia and a couple of other folks too. So if you, you know, are a developer, then of course you should go ahead and check those out as well. Oh, and Furthermore, um, I'm going to focus on the Xbox's implementation of its uh, SSD system here, simply because it shares a lot of similarities to the PC. And the PlayStation 5 does have very similar capabilities, but again, I'm going to focus on the Xbox. Strictly speaking, though, for PC, SSD tech has been around for quite a long time. SATA SSD drives have been capable of over 500 megabytes per second transfer, with the SATA port, of course, limiting transfer speeds uh, with SATA 3. And then we were switching over to NVMe drives years ago, and they have relatively massive throughput. So when the PlayStation and the Xbox were announced and they supported NVMe drives, a lot of PC gamers were like, oh, well, welcome to, you know, now. But yeah, while PCs do have NVMe drives and have for years, the reality is that Consoles are actually ahead here on the PC, ironically enough. And that's because of how the Xbox, for example, handles the decompression of data as well as its IO stack. Microsoft call this stuff, as well as some other things we'll discuss in this video, the Xbox Velocity Architecture. Now I want to discuss, before we proceed any deeper on this, a couple of the challenges that PC gamers currently face and how tech such as direct storage can aim to solve these. We'll go into direct storage and sampler feedback a lot deeper in just a moment. Challenge one is the software. Win32 IO methods, we're finding that even the most capable drive hitting gigabytes per second of read just are not being utilized even slightly to their fullest capability. And now the next problem with direct storage is that, well, the Xbox Series X and the PlayStation 5 have decompression blocks built right in. And if you were to have a CPU, even of a high spec PC, try to decompress all of that data, it would eat multiple cores worth of performance. And sure, if you've got like a, you know, a Ryzen 9 5950X, you might be okay. But most gamers do not have that number of CPU cores available and it still wouldn't be the best method to go ahead. So what's the solution? Now I want you to put a pin on Dorank storage for just a moment as I also feel that we need to clear up the differences between sampler feedback system as well as direct storage as a whole because a lot of people are getting these two terminologies uh, mixed up. As you can see in this slide, sampler feedback system can be thought of as more a smarter way to handle the loading of textured data but direct storage is instead a focus on how to pull in vast quantities of data at much faster rates sampler feedback system and direct storage are not more or less important than the other sfs is critical not just because it better leverages the physical memory on your system but sf also provides better information as to, for example, MIP levels of textures. 
But all of this really means for gamers is that you get richer, more detailed worlds with far less obvious LOD pop-in. Let's dig a bit more into the sampler feedback streaming system. If I were to give you the elevator uh, pitch for this, it would be partial residency of textures that actually make them smart and more powerful, as well as usable for both developers and the system itself. PRT and their tech in this family have many different names and are not a new idea. Even earlier versions of DirectX, for example, supported this. But while the tech has existed for quite a while and isn't new, it's been pretty dumb. The PlayStation 4 as well as Xbox One both supported partially resident textures, but the problem was that the system itself was essentially a black box. You, the developer, couldn't understand what MIP level was being used, as in the texture MIP level. Basically, lower MIP levels equal higher quality textures. And so the GPU and software just couldn't talk to one another either, and you couldn't really understand what MIP levels were being sampled. And this brings us into the difference between sampler feedback and the sampler feedback streaming. Yes, they do mean different things. Microsoft is not being lazy when it's not adding in the word streaming. In a nutshell, SFS is the name of the entire approach Microsoft has to texture streaming, including, for example, PRT. But SF, Sampler Feedback, is the name of the underlying hardware tech and its supporting system, which means that the system itself is not dumb. Claire Andrews does a really good job in a video from Xbox to uh, d demonstrate how this technology works. It's quite technical, but if you are a developer, I'd recommend you check out her video. I'll, of course, link it in the video description. Basically, SFS is the combination of the previously existing technology with changes in hardware, and I stress they are in hardware, which allows the system to actually understand what's going on with textures and MIP levels being used in the game. PRT basically uses virtual memory, and it allows you to essentially break down a scene granularly and pull in texture assets as required. So you don't need the whole texture because say part of an object is obscured. Basically, you would not need the ultra highest quality MIP0 texture if, for example, the camera is further away from the object because you just wouldn't see that level of detail anyway. The system shifts things around in virtual and physical memory, saving huge quantities of VRAM in the process. Again, this is not new specifically, and Microsoft didn't innovate DirectX 12 with PRT, and older DirectX versions did support this. What is new, though, is it's not done in a black box kind of dumb way, something, again, that Claire Andrews went a lot more technically into than what I'm about to. The system itself is pretty dumb with the older PRT models, and there wasn't a great way for various bits of the hardware and software to communicate to one another, let alone what developers were understanding what was actually going on with a scene. So, for example, what texture quality would be best? Artists could hand-tune things, and, you know, kind of, if you are a specific distance away from a thingy, use this quality of MIP for that thingy. So that's where sampler feedback comes in. SF allows the GPU to communicate with the game engine as to what's being sampled and provides feedback, you get it? You get it? Uh, to what actually is happening with that specific scene. So a frame after the scene is drawn, a load of information can then be compiled, such as the angle that the camera is viewing stuff in, the distances you are from that stuff, what stuff is in front of other stuff, and a ton of other variables on that stuff, all of which developers can now see. It isn't just a black box, and this of course allows a much easier time for developers to tweak and adjust the system, as well as the system itself being able to make much more intelligent decisions of what assets it needs to stream in. Mike Sterling does a really good demo of how powerful this is in an Xbox Velocity Architecture video recently uploaded to Microsoft's GameStack channel. I'll link it in the video description. His demo is for the Xbox Series X, but sampler feedback system is already supported with the NVIDIA RTX series as well as AMD's RDNA PC GPUs. And basically the tech works the same as what we're seeing for the Xbox. 
As you can see on screen, there are various memory bars which are colored a darker and lighter shade, the darker shade on the leftmost first. The light region is basically representing the amount of memory used in the previous frame, while the darker region represents the amount of memory loaded but not used in the last frame. This means that if a texture isn't used for a specific amount of time, let's say you run past a series of walls in a city, and those specific cinder block walls aren't used anymore because you've gone past them and there are no other buildings like that, well, that data can go bye-bye and free up that RAM. As you can notice from the SFS memory multiplier, this is essentially the whole sampler feedback streaming making the most out of the RAM and it could feel around three times larger than what it actually would be, simply due to how data is being pulled around and managed. Again, I am missing a ton of very technical details here, but I want you to understand that this is a very cool system indeed and will be critical for GPUs going forward in the PC space. So now let's hop onto the direct storage train. This is basically the opposite side of the coin and aims to pull data into the system as fast as possible and also solve the other problem, actually decompressing that data on the fly and not having the CPU choking on the sheer amount of data that is being pulled in. On PC, users are naturally going to have different levels of hardware. Some folks are gonna load their system up with 32 gigabytes of RAM, multiple NVMe Gen 4 drives, while others will still have eight gigabytes of RAM and slow mechanical drives. This means that the PC platform is going to grow and Microsoft understand this and are building a platform which can basically be leveraged further in the future, depending on how developers of course code their game and also how you upgrade your system. But on the technical side of things, NVMe drives are much faster, of course, than mechanical drives, much faster, 40 times faster or even more. But currently, they're not being used correctly, and it's, well, largely Windows's fault. The Win32 IO system is basically bypassed by direct storage. Microsoft essentially allowing developers the ability to directly harness the power of your NVMe drive. So the flow, as you can see here, the file would be cat dot file type. It's grabbed from the drive in its compressed form. We'll say it's one megabyte. After it's been copied, it's then decompressed by the host CPU. Let's say it's a 3700X. It's now no longer one megabyte because it's decompressed. It's now two megabytes. This data, which is uncompressed now, is then copied across the PCIe bus into the graphics card's memory. There are a couple of issues with this approach. The first is that the host processor is actually slower at doing these decompression operations than a GPU. The second issue is that you're copying uncompressed data across the PCIe bus, thus eating up yet more bandwidth. So now Microsoft detail the new method of handling this. The file is copied from the drive to the system main memory, and then immediately it's sent to the GPU's VRAM. It's still compressed at this point. It's only one megabyte. Then it's decompressed on the GPU. So this one megabyte file is now decompressed to two megabytes. This does bring an obvious question to mind. What about data which is, well, not for the GPU, it's specifically for the host CPU, such as let's say a audio file. Well, in those cases, it will be still decompressed by the CPU itself. But remember the vast quantity of data in modern day games is actually graphics files. So in reality, you're still spending a lot less CPU resources on this. There are multiple benefits of this. The first is that the CPU itself is freed up from doing a lot of heavy lifting, but you also can think of things such as the PCIe bus being way less swamped because you're no longer decompressing data on the host CPU and then sending rather large chunks of data across the bus itself, saving a ton of bandwidth. And this can have ramifications not just in gaming, but also in things like the server market as well. NVIDIA have somewhat detailed the RTX IO solution, and in the documents, it simply says that it runs on the GPU's SMs. 
Based on this and also the language that both Microsoft and other vendors have used in public, I'm assuming this would run on the standard CUDA cores of an NVIDIA GPU or on the shaders of an RX 6000 series card. Whether these instructions though are full operations, lower precision, I'm unsure. According to NVIDIA, the performance impact is quite low since it seems to be using asynchronous compute, basically a compute shader. So with decent scheduling, in theory anyway, well, performance impact would be quite low, but I don't have any performance numbers, which I've been provided, and I haven't had leaks of this yet. So yeah, I would probably go with NVIDIA's information since typically speaking, when they're talking about such things, they are pretty accurate. Microsoft have also stated that the alternative was to wait for GPUs or other decompression technology, but this would take several years, and obviously this would be no good for the PC community. The consoles would just continue to outstrip us, despite the fact that PCs would have way more powerful, let's say, GPUs, but getting data to them would still prove a problem. Therefore, this system is kind of an interim step. Interestingly, though, it does seem like Microsoft are kind of hinting that there will be better solutions in the future, possibly custom decompression technology and either a CPU or a GPU. But obviously they cannot speak about this. If I had to guess, it would probably be the GPU which would have this. But again, Microsoft can't detail it and really it's a discussion for another time. Another big difference with the way that DX handles IO requests as well is that it doesn't just do them one at a time. Basically, you are batching IO requests, which once again is incredibly more efficient. You no longer have to have a, please give me this. Oh, okay, here you go. Okay, cool, I've got it. Hey, wait, I need this one as well. Okay, here you go, constantly happening. Instead, IO requests can be thrown together in large batches of files, which can be chucked over, which again is way more efficient, particularly when dealing with a ton of relatively smaller files. So there you have it, guys. Hopefully you have found this video somewhat informative. It's a little less deep than what I would normally go into this type of topic, but yeah, this is quite a rabbit hole you can go down. And I had started to actually write a more, well, let's say technically inclined script, but I just realized that a ton of people were just kind of asking for the Cliff Notes version of this. So that's kind of where I was going with it. According to Microsoft, as well as NVIDIA, we're going to get a much better understanding of what tech they've been working on. And I assume AMD will do the same as well over the next several months. So I figured I can wait for the more kind of technical breakdown when we actually have a lot more detail and technical demos on how all of this stuff works. I'm really excited though, honestly, because I think this tech is going to be very important for PC gaming. Um, I think we're going to be in a really big transition period for tech at the moment and you know we can kind of already see that tech like hardware based ray tracing is really cool you know nvidia did a really great job pioneering this tech obviously their gpus essentially were used to kind of you know almost map out uh, some of the ideas behind that say xbox's machine learning but ultimately you know, neither the PlayStation or the Xbox are being even slightly pushed to their limits at this point. So it's going to be very interesting to see how all of this stuff unfolds, I feel, over the next couple of years. And also to see what actually happens in terms of market adoption, in terms of standards. Um, yeah, it's going to be very interesting. Also, uh, you know, kind of looking at the broader scope of this, after how this tech is going to impact, let's say, the server market and... Also, what will happen with, let's say, Linux games going forward? Um, yeah, I'm going to be interested to see what happens with, you know, kind of, uh, let's say, Kronos Group and its, uh, you know, its uh, handling of this. With all of that said, thank you very much for checking out the video. If you've enjoyed it, you know what to do. You click the likey button and also subscribe to the channel if you've not already done so. And I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.